there's not a chance in hell that we're going to stay under 1.5 and we're going to go over 2. And as has been said, there'll be a billion record dealers or wherever it's going to be. So I'm not going to be talking about all that because all, you, all of you know that, right? The question and the reason why hopefully you're here is you want to know, like, what's the deal when all this shit happens? And what are we going to do about it? So what I'm going to suggest is two things are on, are on the cards, which are inevitable. The first thing that's inevitable is massive social disruption. And the second thing that's inevitable is there's going to be a pro-social response to that, or there's going to be fascism. So the real issue is not carbon emissions. The real issue is fascism, right? That's, that's actually how it's going to manifest itself uh, in the next 20 years. And everyone's got an idea, you know, about that. You know, what's happening to the Tory party, what's happening in Holland and Italy and blah, 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 right? And we know it's extremely unpleasant. Let's put it like that. You might be thinking, oh, all right, Roger's coming to say some nice things about collectivism, you know, and then we can sort of go, oh, let's do a bit of collectivism or something. So basically, that's wrong, right? I'm here to say collectivism is happening anyway, right? It's going to be happening anyway. Because when a society gets into, into social stress, it's collectivism that takes over. So the issue is, is it going to be fascist collectivism or is it going to be pro-social collectivism, right? So the collectivism is done, right? That's, that's, that's already coming. The issue is, are we going to get with the programme or not, okay? Collectivism has this image of the gulag. <laughs> you know what I mean, doesn't it? Like anyone at Sober 40, oh, collectivism, Soviet yeah. Union, gulag, breaking rocks. You know, we're just going to suggest we should all be breaking rocks or something. You know, that's not what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, what, I, what my definition of collectivism is, is, is like increased social connectivity. Sounds a bit nicer, but that's a bit university ish, isn't it? So, another definition is people come together for the common good right, in its pro-social manifestation, right? That's what it's about. In other words, it's not about me, it's about everyone in this room coming together and saying, okay, what are we going to do together? Because what we do together is a lot more important than what we're doing individually, right? Not just because that's a good thing to do, but that's the only thing to do. Usually, if I do a talk, you know, I've got a plan <laughs> of what you're going to do. But there isn't a plan for what you're going to do, because, not because I've suddenly gone all intellectual on you, but because um, it's still being worked out. But there is like a massive change, I would suggest, which is sort of exciting, amongst the climate and radical spaces around the Western world, right? From this individualist orientation, which you've had for the last 30 years, into this collectivist orientation. And there's variations on the theme, but is a big shift happening. And maybe it's because it's triggered by the realisation it is going to happen now, right? Which doesn't mean we're going extinct. It just means a whole load of shit is coming down the road. And what are we going to do about that? No disrespect, but you're all embedded. What I mean by embedded is you think, oh, no, I'm not a bourgeois individualist. But you are, no disrespect, right? Because you swim in a cultural sea which basically makes you think of things which are bourgeois individualism, right? We're saturated, and you're in that sea, and you can't get beyond that sea because it's all around us. So that's a big challenge for us, and we need leadership and imagination and a bunch of other things I'm going to talk about to get out of that, that sea and actually see what most people in human history have, how they've seen themselves, which is totally different to how we see ourselves. So one way of concretizing this, I suppose, is if we go back 200 years, there's a whole load of traditions which, whether we like know it or not, we're connected with historically that have been collectivist, right? Particularly before 1989. And then, geographically, as, as it were, there's a whole load of cultures that we're vaguely aware of which are collectivist as well, which organize themselves in a totally different way. And if you know the work of David Graeber, everyone knows great David Graeber, do you? He's a cool guy. So, you know, he spent his whole life trying to say to people, we can choose to live differently, right? We are not deterministically having to live in a capitalistic society. It is possible 
to do something else. So I'm going to give like, just to get the juices going as well, I'm gonna give some examples of what I call individualist activism and then a collectivist orientation. So individualist activism is the idea that I become an activist and in the same way as you sort of choose oranges at the supermarket, you see what I mean? It's like, what am I doing this, what am I doing this week? I'm going to be an activist. Now, oh, what's your New Year's resolution? I'm going to try activism. You see, I'm going to try it. And if I don't like it, I'll try something else. In other words, like, it's a transactional, possessive thing, right? It's something you try on for a, for a little while. The other element of individualist activism is, here's me and my little world, my me world, and over there is activism. And every now and again, I do a bit of activism. You know, it's the sort of hobby orientation, you know. First thing I do my activism. The rest of the time, I'm living my real life, you know, making sure I've got money and status and, you know, all this sort of... And then I, I just go and do a bit of activism. So it's that sort of thing. And then the other element of individual activism is, I'm an activist, but in two years, I'll be a banker. <laughs> you know that routine? So for the last 30 years, we're swimming in this sea where that's what activism means, right? You know, that's, that's what people think it is, but it's not, right? There's traditions before, like, 1989, before the neoliberal period, which are totally different. And, and the collectivist activism can might be summed up as, I'm in this for life. It's, that's the orientation of people historically, right? In other words, it's not a thing that I add on to me. It is me. Usual historical like, example of this is socialists in the 20th century or communists in the 20th century. Now, I'm not saying these good or bad people or whatever, you know, that's another issue. But I'm saying, like, in terms of their psychological makeup, these are people who were going, like, this capitalism is going to kill us and I'm going to spend my whole life going against it. That's what I do. I am a socialist, you see what I mean? And it goes to my core. And if I have to fight for it, so be it. And if I have to die for it, so be it. See what I mean? That's what most people historically understand as activism. Right? We're like, we're not the centre of the universe. We're, we're a little outlier, a temporary outlier, right? Before everyone goes back to what it is normally, which is a matter of who you are and what you are for your life. Because that's how serious it is. So when I was like, I'm 57, so I got, you know, I was a bit nerdy when I was a teenager, so I ended up going to Stockport Friends Meeting House up in North, North England. And there were old socialists there, like 70 odd, and used to have these, I loved them because they, they were immaculately dressed and had these little ties, like straight ties, and they'd be sitting there looking really serious and sort of severe. And I'd sit down when I was 15, have a chat to them, and say, they'd say, Roger, there's a right or wrong in this world, you know, and all this sort of thing. And then they say, and if you have to die for it, you have to die for it. I was going, fuck, <laughs> you know, it's like, who is this guy? You know, I just want to go and play my war games or something, you know, wherever. But these were like people who inspired me as a teenager, spent my life doing what I'm doing, because they were the real deal, right? They knew people that fought in the Spanish Civil War. You know, these were like, working class people that just uprooted them and fought for the cause and died for the cause. It was a serious situation, you know, in the mid 20th century. So in a way I'm standing here before you today as that little thread of connectivity to this glorious, amazing collectivist tradition, which we all have to rediscover and re recreate as it were in the 21st century as all the shit hits the fan, like it was in the early 20th century, right? Which doesn't mean it's going to be exactly the same, but it's going to have to be a reintegration into that tradition. And when I was young, you know, I met all these people, like social anarchists, and these people like Colin Ward, you probably haven't heard of this guy, right? He was an amazing guy who did all these housing stuff, do you know? After the Second World War, right? And he was like 75, he was like chain smoking, and oh, well, well, you know, it's all about anarchism. I was like, oh, really? Anyway, you know, these people were amazing people, right? And that's why I'm standing here today. 
that's my tradition. All right, so I'm going to give you some directions of travel, right? Of what activism in a collective orient collectivist orientation could look like going forward. So there's sort of psychological stuff and then there's organisational stuff. On psychological stuff, a collectivist orientation is to say, we're going to go and do an action. So notice we, right? It's not I, it's we. So we all get together in this room and we collectively decide we're going to do this action, right? And maybe one or two people are a bit individualist, that's fine, right? They're having a bad day or that, but to see them up. But everyone else is doing this action. You notice how that works. You don't have a go round where you go, well, you know, I'm going to consult my conscience and I'm going to decide whether to participate. The identity of the room is in the collectivity, right? And that's how, you know, things used to happen. You have a big meeting in the car park and all the workers went on strike, right? They didn't get a form for email saying, do you want to consult, you know, how you feel about this and do you want to do it? Everyone physically got in the same space and they collectively decided what to do there and then, right? Scary stuff, right? You know, oh my God, I'm going to lose my individuality. Oh no, never mind. <laughs> all right, second thing is, when this shit hits the fan, you call a demonstration. Right? You don't have loads of meetings to discuss the demonstration. You just fucking call the demonstration. You say, shit's happening. We're going to meet in, you know, Houses of Parliament at six o'clock. Get your shit down there because there's a fucking emergency. Right? You don't tell them what the plan is. And when you get like 5,000 people, you do the march. Everyone goes on a march. And then all the students say, we're sitting down, everyone. And everyone sits down. No one's filled out a form to say they're into sitting down. They just fucking sit down because everyone else is sitting down because you're a collective entity. And then all please go and arrest everyone, right? And everyone's going, so be it. Why is everyone going, so be it? Because your identity is integrated into that crowd, right? This is what's called classical civil resistance. You know, when they had Tahrir Square, didn't like have a load of, like, you know, pre-meetings. They just said, we're going to Tahrir Square. People didn't think, well, I might get arrested or I might not. They just fucking went because they were fed up. When they got there, they found themselves wanting to stay there, even though they might get shot. That's how it works. That's how collectivist classical civil resistance works. This is something we're discussing in JSO, right, is, you know, how can we construct that moment of, of organic rebellion, you see? That's, that's how history works, for better or worse. It's like a collectivist thing. Okay, when you go to prison, no, no, no pressure. <laughs> when you go to prison, it's not like, I consulted my conscience, I've read for Rome, and now I'm ready to go to prison. It's like, we're fucking going to prison, right? Everyone in this room is going to prison. We're all going to prison, right? Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. See what I mean? We're going to do something, and we go to prison as a collective entity. So when you're in prison, you're not feeling all sad and lonely. Because, oh, I've made a decision to go to prison. It's not very nice. You're going, fucking great. We're all in prison, right? And then when you get out of prison, you could debrief together. You don't go... Well, I'm not sure, I don't really want to go to the debrief. You fucking go to the debrief, right? Because you're a collectivity. You know, people say, you know, you know this, like, culture of going, uh, oh, if you want to take part in the action, you have to go to the training, right? When you go to prison, you have to debrief with everyone else. It's not an option, okay? And if you're feeling a bit funny about it, you don't go and have individual therapy, Right? You go and talk to the other people that have been to prison and you work it out as a group. That's collectivity, right? Now, I'm not saying, like, that's the only game in town. I'm not saying, like, this is some utopian, you know, whatever. I'm just saying that's the tradition that traditionally has brought about revolutionary change, right? It's not about me. And this connects with the broader and main point I'm trying to make, which is you all have to engage in transcendence, right? That's a funny sort of word, so you can call it something else. But what it basically means is I'm not actually that important, right? I'm just like this bod who's on the planet for a little while and then I'm gonna die. It's really not that important. 
And when shit things happen to people, they suddenly realise, often, always, you're not actually that important. <coughs> What's important is that you're in a collective project with other human beings, and you're in service to that project, right? That's what you are. You're not an individual. You're part of this collective entity of resistance. And so be it. You see what I mean? So it doesn't matter if shit happens to you, because you're not actually that bothered about Roger Hallam. You see? I'm not that bothered about myself. You can put me in jail like in two weeks' time. I don't give a fuck. Seriously. I mean, it's a bit annoying because I've got other things to do. Right? Because I'm not actually that bothered about myself. Right? You, you see what I mean? Now, let's go to dark sides. Right? I'm not being utopian about it, right? It's good stop sides. All I'm saying is, is that's the deal if you want to have a revolution, right? If you want to actually create a pro-social society which is going to combat fascism, you need to have that vanguardist orientation. It's like sign up at the end of this meeting, not signing up for the next action. You are signing up to do the revolution for the next fucking 40 years. See what I mean? I'm in. Because it's not going away, right? In the early 20th century, fascism was not going away. It was a lifetime commitment. You have to make that lifetime commitment to actually do this shit. Otherwise, you're going to have fascism. Sorry. <laughs> right? It's a big deal, right? This is the way humans have had to cope with things for 10,000 years. You know, we're just having a nice little patch. That's the way it is. Organisationally, what does collectivity mean? So here's a few ideas. Number one, you're in an affinity group, right? You're not in an affinity group for an action. You're in an affinity group for five years. Yeah? Your affinity group is your group, right? It's the people you love and connect and will die for. You see what I mean? You go out in action together and you know each other and you know Joe's a bit funny about that and you know Jack's story, you see what I mean? You know each other intimately. Right? Because you go out over and over again in struggle against the system. Right? That doesn't mean everyone's going to do the frontline stuff. You're a team. But the, thing, the point here about collectivity is you're part of that team over time. Right? It's not transactional. It's not like, oh, the four of you, we're going to go and sit in the row next week. And, and after that, be, bye, thanks very much. Right? It's like we're meeting once a fortnight. Right? And we're a team. And and we're in soft competition with North Hackney team, you know what I mean? Because they're not actually that nice to join our team. Yeah? Because we have better soup nights. See what I mean? So, you know, because there's going to be loads of soup nights soon, isn't there? They're all going to be in soft competition. You know, you don't want to go to Camden. <laughs> <laughs> it's that lentil stuff. <laughs> so a little example of this was in the peace, peace, peace movement in 1986, 1987. There were 50 affinity groups in, in, in London. 50 affinity groups. And they got their shit organised and they went and, and jumped over nuclear bases. And these people would work together for two years in their affinity group. You see what I mean? That's the plan. And yeah, you need to get your piece of paper out and go, you want to be in our affinity group? Sign and dot lives, two year commitment. You have to ask for that commitment. See, I mean, you can't be all individualist about it. Oh, it's okay, you want to you leave after three months, that's fine. Right? You say it's a two year commitment to get into ours. Right? We're the real deal. See what I mean? And yeah, yeah, you know, you're not going to break your legs if you, if you leave, but you just give you a funny look. No one fucking talks about income, do they? It's a bit like, oh, I can't pay my fight. Oh, I can pay my fight. Oh, great, thanks. You know what I mean? And if you're lucky, someone will give you a little bit of money to pay your fight. That's individualist charity, right, traditionally. Right, collectivism is we all give 10% of income to a central fund, and if you need the money, you get the money. See what I mean? That's what's called socialism. In case you bought socialism with somebody else, right? You collectivise your resources. This was normal, right? You know, it's a guy called Rob Callender. Do some of you know him? He's been doing these talks, right? Where he's going, people all around the world basically collectivise their income. So that when people have a hard time, you can help each other out because there aren't banks. Like when I, when I, was, when I was young, there was an income sharing group in Leicester that had gone for 20 years, right? Housing. Housing's funny, isn't it? What's happening? You know what I mean? It's like, you're in a house, you get chucked out, and you think, oh shit, I've got to find another house. That's pure bourgeois individualism, right? Collectivism is like, they're going to throw us out. Well, we're not going to move. That's collectivism. With a hundred other houses. 
how come the 100 other houses aren't going to like, go on red stripe for you? Because you have an individualist orientation, because you've been told since you were eight that you're only there to look after yourself. Bollocks! That's why young people in London are paying, what, 60% of their rent, their income on rent. It's because they don't collectivise, right? I organised a red stripe in London, like before XR, seven years ago, 10,000 people, 10% uh, rent reduction within three months. Took about 100 hours of door knocking. Come and see me afterwards. Honestly, it's easy, right? The reason it's not happening is because everyone goes, oh, we've, we've got to move house. Oh, all right, we'll move house. See what I mean? It's like, no, be collectivist about it, right? Let's all combine together. Don't do some door knocking. Find out who your landlord is. You've got another 100 houses. Find out where they are. Everyone starts paying the rent. Say, fuck you. Right? It's easy. It's happened 100 times before. The reason it's not happening, because we haven't been into this collectivist culture. Investment. What are you doing with all your money? You know, you've got it on the bank. Why the fuck have you got it in the bank? You're supporting capitalism. Why don't you set up your own bank, for God's sake? It's not that complicated. Right? I did it when I was 20. Right, a bunch of anarchists said, we're going to set up our own bank. We, 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 we financed dozens of activist houses in the 1980s. Easy peasy. Get your money together, put it into a company, and go and buy some houses. Not that complicated. You see what I mean? It's like, why aren't you thinking about this? This is the first, I've only started saying this in the last six months, because I'm embarrassed. <laughs> because the climate movement is so fucking individualist. It is. It's just appalling. You know? It's like, there was that tradition, you know, it died in the 1980s because of Thatcherism, and, and now it's got to be rediscovered because the shit's going to hit the fan. What I'm not saying is you all get together in your little communes and overbond, okay? So this is like individualist collectivism, right, as you might sort of call it. So this happened, like, for, for most, most, a lot of my life. It's like, we're going to become communists, we're going to become collectivists, and we're going to go to the land, and, and we're going to... We're going to all weed together on Thursday morning, right? That's, that's like inward-looking, overbonded, fucked collectivism. In the peace movement, everyone decided we were going to be collectivist at the end of the peace movement. What that meant, basically, is people were so, felt so intensely about each other. You'd be in a meeting, and two people would go upstairs to have sex with each other. They would, right? Because they, they thought they were so overbonded that the whole of activism collapsed. Because everyone was so, you know, stuck in a meeting to discuss, you know, where the ketchup was going to go. You know, all that sort of stuff. That is inward collectiv collectivism. The collectivism that we're talking about here, the pro-social collectivism, is like communism or Christianity. Those are the two models. I'm not saying we could become Christians or communists, right? But if you look at those two traditions, they were collectivists and they were outward-facing, right? You know, on Saturday morning... They'd be with the workers, you know what I mean? They'd be writing letters to the Athenians, whatever they did. See what I mean? Go, guys, you've got to be Christian, right? You know, you might die, but never mind. You know, <laughs> it's like you're outward facing. In other words, if you're going to be like pro-social collectivist, every Thursday night for the next 30 years, you need to go door knocking, right? So what I want to have on a, on a T-shirt is door knocking or fascism. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, let's concretize it, right? You want to fucking get out there and talk to people, or they're going to come and get you. Because they're all reading social media, right? You've got to go and door knock, you've got to go and create the assemblies. Not because, oh, it's just like a thing I'm doing in order to get something to happen. It's because it's the essence of who you are. You see what I mean? It is the plan to get out there and talk to ordinary people. If you haven't done that, we're done for, right? The only reason everyone's sitting here tonight is because some of us did a thousand public meetings, right? That's how we built GSI, right? Grind, right? And you think, oh my God, what a big ask. You know, Roger's asking all this stuff. Da, 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 da. That's how most people worked, right? Before 1989. My dad went out leafleting every fucking weekend for 30 years for the Liberal Party, right? That's what people used to do because he cared, right? Because he was brought up in World War II. He knew what was, would happen. When you're deciding, when you are deciding, obviously you're not going to decide as an individual right now, because you know, but when you all decide to become collectivists, as it were, then you need to decide to do this not because you're trying to be nice, right? 
doing something because you're trying to be nice or ethical or moral isn't actually like that valuable. People decide to do something like a fundamental change in how they operate because of deep metaphysical reasons. In other words, this is the way the world is. It's like a fundamental realization that you are not like this weak, vulnerable individual. You are part of the collective. See what I mean? You, you realize you are part of a larger ideological project. In other words, there has to be a theory of society and a theory of life that is different to the capitalistic one, right? And we're not sure at the moment what that, look, that looks like. When you think about the communists and the Christians, that's why they went out every weekend, right? They didn't go out every weekend because they wanted to be nice. They went out in, in, every weekend because that was their worldview, right? That, what, that is what it was to be Roger Halliday, see what I mean? So it's something along the lines of shit's coming down the road and this is going to create positivity because it will bring us all together to do great stuff to get ourselves out of this shit. You see what I mean? So it's not just, hey, all this crap's coming. It's all this crap's coming and that's going to be a good thing because it's going to bring us all together. And that's a good thing, right? You're not going to be miserable in bed sits. We're all going to come together and we're going to sort this fucking situation out. Bang! Oh yeah, right, that's what I'm doing in my life. That sounds good. See what I mean? Sign up, 20 years, thank you very much. So with just a poil, like at the moment, this is what we're fumbling towards, right? Is a revolutionary orientation. So instead of asking the state, can you do this, if you don't mind, otherwise we'll sit in the road, we're going to be going, we're not asking you anymore because we want to get rid of you, right? We want to get rid of the fucking system because the fucking system is never going to give us anything. That's a revolutionary orientation. It has an ideology that goes with it. To, so that the next 30 years, we know what we're doing, right? We're changing the whole system, and we know what we want. And in the short term, everyone's going to think we're dicks, right? And anyway, loads of people thought I was dicks, and loads of people still think I'm a dick, right? But, you know, I'm standing here. Yeah. My, my supervisor at King's College he used to say to Roger, if you can't continue to hold those views, you'll make yourself irrelevant, I always remember. And then, like, Central Bex said, fuck you. Do you know what I mean? I was like, ah. <laughs> So, you know, we don't want to get too eager about it. But you see what I mean? Right? We're going to be ahead of the curve, like the communists were ahead of the curve and the Christians were. So the last thing is about leadership. Now, everyone in this room, like, you're all feeling a bit, like, stressed because you've got all this guy rumbling onto you, right? But if you're going to, if you're going to do this project, and this is the biggest challenge, you all have to get up like me and become leaders, right? Because there's massive forces to drag everyone back into that capitalistic individualism, you know what I mean? By Wednesday morning, you've probably forgotten about this and go, oh yeah, yeah, maybe, you know, blah, 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 right? The counterbalance to that is leadership. This is what, like, genuine leadership is. It's to stand up, you go to your meeting, you stand up and you say, we're gonna have an income sharing group, guys. Not like, do we want to? You stand up and say, we're gonna do this. See what I mean? We're going to do this and this is going to happen, right? We're going to collectivize our income. We are all going to go to prison together. Not do you. Do you want to go to prison? No, that's individual. We are going to go to prison together. It's fucking outrageous what's happening. Okay, is that all right with everyone? You see what I mean? That's the spirit of revolutionary leadership. And that's what everyone needs to step up and do. Which is tricky, right? It's always tricky and then you just do it. What it means in the assemblies, right? The assemblies are going to, these assemblies are going to be created, right? And there's a big debate in the assemblies movement. But some people go, you bring all these people together, right? And then you do this liberal routine of going, I'm not going to tell all of you what to think. You can decide yourselves what to think because I don't want to be oppressive. Everyone gets into breakout groups and then everyone replicates the ideology of the system because there isn't a neutrality, right? Not influencing people just means they're going to replicate what they've heard on social media. At the beginning of the assembly, you need to get up and say, I'm a fucking revolutionary, right? I believe in this. I believe in this. This is what we need to do. And now you are going to decide what you want to do, right? So it's a third way, right? So the individualist liberals are going, oh, you can do what you like, right? All the Leninists are saying, you've got to agree with me, otherwise I'm breaking your leg, right? <laughs> the third way is to say, 
this is who I am. I'm authentic, right? Everyone in this room knows what I believe, right? This is what I believe. And you now have to decide what you're going to do. And just coming back to my final point about David Graeber, right? What David Graeber was saying is you, the most powerful and subversive idea in the world is imagination. In other words, you have to give people in this country permission to dream of something fundamentally different. And once you give them that permission, they're going to go, fuck yeah, we want something different. They're not going to do that unless you propose that positive programme to them in the assembly, you know, on the BBC interview. So it's not just, oh, this shit's going to happen. So all this shit's going to happen. And then we're going to do something great about it. We're going to get rid of you, the interviewer, for starters. You know what I mean? You're over, mate. Just look to the camera and say, guys, let's do it. You know, who's the Zoom name? You see what I mean? It's like fun, dare I say. I know everyone's looking club. But it's fun because that's what living your life's about, right? It's about doing whatever you think is what you are at this point in history. And we're all in it together, and so we all have to come together. Right? That's the old ideology. And everything has to change, right? So we have to commit our lives to that change. That's collectivism for the 21st century. Put your hand up if you think that's a good idea. Put your hand up. Great. Well done. You can give yourself a clap. <laughs>